We are in Acts chapter 17, verse 22. And if you're physically able, would you stand with me one last time as we uh, read through the Word of God this morning. Acts 17, 22. It says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temple made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries of their dwellings so that each should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being and also, as some of your own prophets have said, for we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are offsprings of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some of the men joined him and believed, among them Dionysus, and the Acrobite, and a woman named Dem- Demarius, and others with them. And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. Father, we thank you so much for your word before us today, and I pray that you would make it applicable to our hearts, that we would hear, that we would understand what you want us to hear. But I believe you have a special word for each of us in the room, those watching online, those in the video sanctuary. I pray that we would have ears to hear and a heart that would understand what you want to say to us today. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated. Today we are continuing our study in the book of Acts. And you Bible students know well by now, right, that Acts was written by who, class? Luke, that's right. The same guy that wrote Luke wrote Acts. It's the second part to the book. And it's so important that he wrote the book Acts because Acts is really the bridge between the New Testament Gospels and the New Testament Epistles, right? You've heard this before. The first four books of the Bible, or, that would be the first four books of the Bible. First four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the Gospels, are the story of Jesus Christ. And then the Epistles, starting with Romans through the end of the New Testament, are the letters that the New Testament authors wrote to the New Testament church. But imagine if we didn't have Acts. You'd end with John 21, Jesus is alive, he's headed to heaven. And the next chapter in your book, your Bible would be Romans 1. And we would think, how did the church get to Rome and who's this Paul guy? But we don't ask any of those questions because we have the book of Acts. The book of Acts is also a very important book in the New Testament because it's one of the only books that has with it its own divine outline. An outline that I didn't give it or Warren Wiersbe didn't give it, God gave the outline. Jesus himself, right before he ascended, said to his disciples in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And as you know well by now, the book of Acts follows that outline exactly. The first seven chapters, the church is located only in the city of Jerusalem. That's where it started. Then under the leadership of Philip and because of persecution, the church moves on to Judea and Samaria, the central and southern parts of the nation of Israel. Then in chapter 10, under the leadership of 1 Peter, then the Apostle Paul, the church spreads out to the Gentile world and to the ends of the earth. And that's the section we are currently in. This Wednesday night, we're going to continue our chapter-by-chapter study of Acts and its expansion into the Gentile world as we see the end of Paul's second missionary journey. 
And his second missionary journey church is really one of the most important mission strips in all of human history. Churches like Galatia, Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth, Ephesus are all planted on this missionary journey. And this Wednesday, we'll see Paul in Athens, we'll see Paul in Corinth, and we'll see Paul in Ephesus. And we'll learn a little bit about those cities, but as we see those churches planted in those cities, it will change forever the way you study and read First and Second Corinthians and the book of Ephesians as you see why those books were written the way they were when you understand things about how those churches were planted. And so it's an important study this Wednesday night. But this morning, I've had you turn and we read... Paul's most famous sermon, his sermon in Athens on the famous hill called Mars Hill. And this sermon that Paul gives on the Areopagus, another name for what we call today Mars Hill, it is seen by many Bible scholars as the finest sermon ever preached. They study it in seminaries. They produce whole classes on learning to preach like Paul did on Mars Hill. And on the surface, I totally understand why. He starts by being very culturally relevant. Paul has been in the city of Athens for a while. He sees how religious the people of Athens were. And he notices beyond even the Greek pantheon of gods, gods like Zeus and Poseidon, Bacchus, Ares, Athena, Apollo, Aphrodite, and all many, many other goddesses and gods. They, even beyond that, they had an altar there that Paul noticed to the unknown god. The Greeks, just in case they missed one and their their many, many gods and goddesses they worship, they had an altar to the unknown God. And I admit, it's brilliant on the part of the Apostle Paul to say, let me tell you about this unknown God. And Paul begins to describe the true and living God, that he's creator of heaven and earth, that he's too vast to dwell in temples made with hands. And just imagine the view from the Areopagus as Paul is saying this. The view behind them would be the great Acropolis that was absolutely standing and wasn't going through renovations like it is in that picture. And it is today and has been for many, many years. They would see these great Greek temples on the hill above them as Paul is saying, God doesn't dwell in a temple made with hands. Then he quotes from two prominent Greek philosophers, Epimenides and Erastus, who said of their own gods, in him we move and live and have our being, for we are his offspring. And Paul tells them that the true and living God isn't made of silver and gold, but he does command us to repent and get right with him and that God raised Jesus from the dead. And again, modern Bible teachers love this sermon. They name their churches and ministries after the hill, Mars Hill, that Paul taught it on. And they say, rightfully so, it was so relevant, Paul picking up where they were as a culture, quoting their philosophers to prove his point, using imagery that they could look over their shoulders and see this is really the perfect sermon. And I agree with the champions of Paul's sermon on Mars Hill. It was incredibly creative. It was culturally relevant. It was using everything you could think of to capture the hearts and minds of the hearers. It was an absolutely brilliant sermon that was well delivered, well prepared, well thought through. It was an awesome sermon. But then look at the results in verse 32 through 34. It'll also be up on the screens. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysus, the Agrippite, and a woman named Demarius and others with him. Some mocked, some said, we'll hear you again later. And yes, a handful of people believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And for them, Paul's efforts in Athens, obviously, they are eternally grateful for. But consider, church, outside of these few converts, there was no church planted in Athens at this time. In fact, a church would not be planted in Athens for over a hundred years from this moment in history. And you contrast that to what we've already studied in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea, what we'll study this this Wednesday night in Corinth and Ephesus. Every place Paul went, hundreds of people came to know the Lord. 
Churches were planted that last for hundreds to a thousand years, affecting the cities that they ministered in. And yet you contrast that fruit in Paul's ministry to what we see in Athens after this sermon that everybody wants to study and everybody wants to copy. And I personally think Paul would differ with the current expert's opinion that this was the sermon to emulate, that this was the example to follow. I think Paul would disagree. Now, why would I think that? Well, beyond just the fruit aspect of the sermon, as we read there in chapter 18, verse 1, immediately after the sermon on Mars Hill, Paul goes immediately 50 plus miles to the city of Corinth. You can see on the map his journey there, the 50 miles, the next slide, from Athens to Corinth. And then you can see pictures of what Corinth looks like today with the ruins there. And the next, the artist rendering of what it looked like when it was a city of well over 700,000 people. Paul is going to a giant town in the ancient world there in Corinth. And as he's on the journey, he has a thought to himself, a thought that he shares later with the Corinthian church when he writes his letter to them. He writes a letter to them there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we get a little insight into Paul's mindset as he headed into the city of Corinth. It says there, and I, brethren, when I came to you, in other words, what we're reading right now in the book of Acts, when I left Athens and I came to you, Paul says, I did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And my speech, Paul says, and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul tells the Corinthian church, when I came to you, in direct opposition to the way he ministered and preached in Athens. When Paul came to Corinth, he determined not to come with excellence of speech. He determined not to be culturally relevant, quoting, quoting philosophers and using what the culture was interested in in that moment. Paul determined not to do any of that, but instead, as he says there in verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 2, I just wanted to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And you see, although Paul's sermon in Athens was brilliant, no doubt, it was culturally relevant, absolutely. It was all of those things. But he also did not once mention the name of Jesus. He did not once mention the cross. And now I'm speculating when I say this, but I just imagine as he's leaving Athens, experiencing the very little fruit that he did, maybe he thought, I'm done with that. I'm done with the pithy little sayings and the brilliant opening illustrations. I'm done with cloning philosophers and using relevant illustrations. And the next town I'm going to, when I get to Corinth, I am determined to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And the fruit of that? Well, hundreds of people in the city of Corinth gave their lives to the Lord. And the city that will be planted there will last a thousand years, affecting the culture and the city of Corinth for generations. All from the simple but powerful message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now that's an interesting point, but what I want to focus on for the rest of the time is... It's one thing to say, all I'm going to focus on is Jesus Christ and Him crucified... But as a guy that was living in Corinth for 18 months, for a year and a half, how is that subject enough to deal with the issues that people need to deal with as they want to grow in the Lord? Yes, Jesus Christ and Him crucified is a great salvation message, but can you really grow in your relationship with the Lord simply focusing on Jesus and the cross? Well, I want to propose to you that almost every issue we face as believers, almost every question we have as disciples of Jesus Christ, almost everything we need to know can be found in the truth, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
And that's important for you to know because sometimes we get into our mind, if I'm going to be effective for the kingdom of God, I have to go to school for 10 years, I have to read all these books with little, little print, and then I go before an ordination board, and if I pass all of that, then maybe I can encourage people in their walk with the Lord. And listen, I understand why you may think that. Our world seems to press that idea on you. Well, where did you get your training? Where did you go to seminary? And listen, if that's what God is calling you to do, I say praise the Lord, go for it. But I also want to remind you this morning that you can be super effective for the kingdom of God, answering questions, dealing with issues as you take those issues and think, how does Jesus and him crucified answer the issue I'm up against right now? And to give you a few examples, how Jesus Christ and him crucified can answer almost anything before we go our way today, some people, friends, some people doubt God's love. You've run into them, haven't you? People just saying, I can't believe that God loves me. I've done so much wrong. I've done so many things. Listen, I know you say it Sunday after Sunday, pastor, but I just don't really believe God loves me. What do we do when our own heart asks that question? What do we do when others around us doubt the love of God? Do we delve back into their past as children and realize how their bad relationship with their father makes it hard for them to believe in father's God's love? Well, listen, there are experts that are well-trained to do exactly that. But you and I just need to remind them of Jesus Christ and him crucified. How so? Well, do you remember that Paul said to the Romans in Romans 5, 8, he said, but God demonstrated his own love toward us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think of the power of that truth, precious church. Jesus died for you when you didn't give a rip about him. You weren't interested in fellowship. You weren't interested in his love. You were interested in rebellion and serving yourself. And God said, I love that dirty, rotten sinner just the way they are. And I'm going to go to a cross and love them with my life just the way they are. He loved you before you loved him. His love is so powerful. It's kind of like, imagine this, girls. Your dreamboat guy shows up at your door, but it's the wrong time. You've got a mud mask all over your face. You've got cucumbers glued to your eyes. You've been enjoying some good daytime TV, if there is such a thing. And by enjoying, I mean there's some food hanging off that mask as it's dripping off your chin. And you open the door, and there he is. And you say, <gasps> and he says, wow. You are so beautiful. I love you so much. Wow. I'd like to spend the rest of my life with you. In fact, right now, here I go. Wham. Down on one knee, he proposes. You're like, hold on. <laughs> yes. And you begin this relationship. Well, what if then later you're on a date and you're dressed to the hilt? Your makeup is perfect. There's no food dripping off your chin. And you look over him and say, how do I know that you love me? How do you know? Because he loved you when you were nasty. He loved you when stuff was dripping off your chin. Of course he loves you when you're dressed to perfection, when the makeup is perfect. And the illustration isn't perfect, but hear me on this church. Jesus loved you when you were nasty. And now that you're a child of God, his love for you is unbroken. When you doubt the love of God, you need to look at the cross of Jesus Christ who died for you when you didn't give a rip about him. And we realize God loves us. Why? Because of Jesus Christ and him crucified. For some of you, the doubt isn't God's love. For some of you, you doubt God's provision. Well, I know God loves me. I just don't think he's going to provide for me. I just don't think he's going to pay that electric bill that I have. And I, I, it's summertime and it's hot and I got to keep my air conditioning on. And now how am I going to pay for all of that? What's the answer for that? Well, do we, do we, do we transfer people's doubts, you know, and how they have people have let them down, how they hurt them and how that doubt transfers to the Lord? The professionals can handle all of that. You remind them of Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
What do I mean? Well, Paul also said to the Romans in Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What is Paul saying? Paul is saying God gave to you his son. He loved you so much, he provided for you his own son. And if God would give you his son, what's an electric bill? What's a a medical bill? Of course God is going to take care of you. I know that because he already gave you everything he has. It'd be kind of like this. My wife and I got our son for his 16th birthday, probably the biggest present he's ever gotten up to this date. He got a fairly nice computer. And the reason we did that is, number one, he's going to be doing some online school next year. And then secondly, he's a musician. So he's, he's got editing software to write songs and edit songs and produce songs. And it, it, was, it was a good investment in, in our retirement someday. So, so we, we decided to get this computer for him. But, but imagine, we, we spent all this money on a computer and I walk into his room and it's just there and it's off. And I say, well, why is the computer not on? Well, I'm really thankful for this computer, but... Then I went to plug it in and and the cords busted. And since you've already spent all this money on a computer, I just, I didn't want to even ask you for a cord. Well, number one, this conversation would never happen because my son would say, cord now. But but, uh, uh, that aside, that aside. In the illustration, I would say, what what are you talking about? We talk about, we spent so much money on a computer. What's a dinky little cord? Of course, we're going to get you a cord so you can plug it in and use it. We already did this. Of course, we're going to do that. And again, the illustration isn't perfect. But friends, when we say, I don't know if God's going to provide for this bill. I don't know these medical procedures I've had. If he's going to come through, he's already come through by giving you his son. Of course, of course, he's going to come through for the rest. The answer when you doubt God's provision is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Some of you doubt God's love. Some of you doubt God's provision. For some of you, it's God's direction, God's decisions. Oh, I know he loves me. I know he'll provide for me, but I just don't know if his will is best for me. I think if I serve him, he might send me to some place in the world I don't want to go. I don't, I don't like bugs. So he's going to send me to the most tropical rainforest I can find. And bugs are going to crawl on me until eternity. I don't know what God you serve, but that's craziness. How do we know God's will is best for us? Well, again, Jesus Christ and him crucified. A few days before the crucifixion, James and John's mom, Salome, comes to Jesus. You remember? And mommy, mommy of James and John says, Jesus, I've got a little request. Can my sons sit at your right hand and your left hand when you enter into the kingdom? Can they just be there, your right and left hand, when you come into the kingdom? And Jesus gives her the weirdest answer. He says this in Matthew 20, verse 22. Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink from the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? Would you sometimes feel like you get that from the Lord when you pray? God, what am I supposed to do? Baptism in cups. What? (laughs) What does that even mean? What do you want me to do? And no doubt, Salome felt, what kind of answer, cryptic answer is that? I just want my sons to to be your right-hand man and your left-hand man as you come into the kingdom. Why can't you give me a straight answer? Why can't you just do what I want you to do? You ever feel that way with the Lord? Salome definitely did. She did until when? Until the crucifixion. Salome was there. We know from the gospel, she was there at the foot of the cross while Jesus was being crucified. She heard one of the thieves say to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And it must have hit her like a ton of bricks. This is Jesus entering his kingdom. This is Jesus accomplishing all that he came to do. And I asked that my sons would be on his right hand and his left hand as he entered the kingdom. But it's not my boys. It's two thieves being crucified with him at the moment of the crucifixion. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for not answering my prayer request. You see, I thought I knew it was best for my life, but I see 
as you demonstrate in front of me your love for me on the cross, that you always have my best in mind. You always have what's best for me in mind. And so God, instead of fighting, instead of pretending that I know what is best and pouting when I don't get my way, God, I want to trust that the God that loved me enough to die for my sins loves me enough to lead me into every good and perfect thing in my life. You see, when I begin to doubt God's direction, I need to remember Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Some of you may doubt God's love. Some of you may doubt God's provision. Some of you may doubt God's decision. For some of you, it's even more practical than that. It's not, it's not an emotion that you deal with. You have a real struggle, a real struggle with addiction. You're addicted to something. Some sin has a stranglehold upon your life. What does Jesus Christ and Him crucified have to do with my real world addiction? Friends, everything. For Paul said again to the Romans, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Something happened on the cross. Our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul tells the Roman Christians that on the cross, more than just being forgiven for our sins, that's awesome, more than just having our our, our penalty being paid by Jesus there on the cross, that absolutely happened. But more than that, Paul tells us that our old man, our old sin nature was crucified there with Jesus. Why? That he no longer We would no longer be slaves of sin, that he might be done away with. And that English phrase, done away with, is the Greek word kartageo, and it means to be rendered inactive. Paul is telling us on the cross, not only were your sins paid for, not only was your guilt taken away, but on the cross, the authority of your old sin nature was done away with, with Jesus' death on the cross, meaning you no longer have to sin. That authority, that old man's authority has no authority over you any longer. It reminds me, when I was a freshman in high school, many Many, many moons ago. When I was a freshman in high school, I couldn't wait to play freshman football for Los Alamitos High School. The varsity team had just won the state championship the year before, and I couldn't wait to be part of the championship program. The freshman coach's name was Coach Barnes, and he let us know that first day in two-a-days, if you want to play for me in this school... Well, then my voice is the voice of God. That's a direct quote from Coach Barnes. My voice is the voice of God to you. If I say jump, you say how high. If I say run, you keep running till I think of something else. You want to play for me, that's the way it's going to be. And during that season of football, Coach Barnes had total authority over me. But I'm no longer a freshman in high school as you can tell. That was a long time ago. I no longer dream of playing high school football. And that means Coach Barnes, wonderful guy that he was, no longer has authority over my life. Now listen, he can still show up. He was a young man when I was a freshman, so I'm sure Coach Barnes is still around. He could show up my house tomorrow and start yelling, Duff, like he used to. Duff, Duff, look at you. This is what I feared when you quit football for golf. This is what I feared. Look at you. Look at you. You need to go for a run, Duff. And I could listen to Coach Barnes. I could could agree that he was right and just start running. But listen to me. I don't want to play football for him any longer. Meaning he no longer has authority over me as he did when I wanted to start for the Griffins. So I can choose to run. You can still choose to give in to your old nature. You can choose to sin, but you no longer have to because that authority was crucified with Jesus on the cross. 
And I want you to hear this, precious men and women, that old man, your own sin nature that used to have authority over you as it shouted its demands and you would give in because you were under its authority. When Jesus died, yes, your sins were forgiven. Yes, your place in heaven was secured. But sin's power over you died on the cross as well. And you can choose today to follow God's heart for your life and be free from sin and addiction. How do I do that? Well, Paul says there in verse 11, reckon it to be so. You can tell Paul's from the South because he words used like reckon. Reckon it to be so. Reckon yourself dead to sin. Just make a decision. I am dead to sin and instead I want my life alive to God. How can we be free from addictions? Jesus and him crucified. Maybe you struggle with God's love. Maybe you doubt God's provision. Maybe you doubt God's decision. Maybe you struggle with addiction. Maybe for you, you struggle with depression. You're just sad. It's depression. And how do we, how do we help people in that place? Do we, do we analyze their diet? Again, let the professionals do what they do. But as believers, we can encourage them with Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You see, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If I try to hang on to my life, Jesus says, I'm going to lose it. But if I lose my life in him, I will find what life is meant to be. So I take up my cross and precious ones. So often when people talk about taking up their cross, they speak of some heavy trial they have to bear. My disease is my cross. My marriage is my cross. And I understand what people are saying when they say that. But for Jesus, think it through. The cross was more than a trial. Oh, it was a trial. But the cross at its essence was Jesus doing something for someone else. It's what he did for you and for me to save us from our sin. And I know for me, and please hear me, I am not talking about clinical depression when I say this. You can save your emails. Some people have things they need medication to fix. I'm talking about good old, I am sad depression. And for me, for me, I don't have a medical condition. I've got lots of them, but none of them that deal with depression. So occasionally when I'm sad, it's always because I am focused on me. That's what the cause of it always is. It's always, why is this person being mean to me? Why is this thing that I'm doing not fulfilling me? Why doesn't everyone realize how wonderful I am? Boo-hoo. Oh, bother. And when I get that way, when we get that way, the answer is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Like, when, like Jesus, I need to take up my cross, not necessarily my trial that I have to face, but my cross is in what can I do to bless other people? When I'm focused on me, I need to get my eyes off of myself and my issues and find ways to bless other people. As has been said many times before, the way out of self-focused depression, not clinical depression, but self-focused depression, good old-fashioned, I'm focused on me depression, the answer is 10 steps. Do something to bless someone else and repeat it nine times. Live for others like Jesus lived and watch your heart fill with joy. The answer is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Maybe you doubt God's love. Maybe it's his provision. Maybe it's his decisions. Maybe you struggle with addiction or depression. Maybe for you, the issue is bitterness. Bitterness. You just can't forgive and get over what's been done to you by someone else sinning against you. And listen, I know those feelings are real. I know those feelings are powerful. And I don't mean to diminish in any way what happened to you. The sin that was committed against you in any way. I don't mean to diminish it. But my heart for you as your pastor is what does letting bitterness tear you apart do to help you overcome what was done to you? Do you hear me on that? That's my heart for you. What does letting bitterness tear you apart do to help you overcome what was done to you? The answer is nothing. We have to find a way out. What way? Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
I know when I'm experiencing bitterness because of something that was done to me, I have found it helpful to take a minute or three and remember all that Jesus forgave me on that cross. There's a ton. There's a ton. All the willful sins I've committed against him, all the attitudes I've had, knowing what I am doing is fully wrong when I do it. You think you struggle with guilt, you should try sinning as Pastor Jason. I know what I'm doing is wrong because I just taught on it 10 minutes ago. And yet God forgives me. God loves me. God just washes away all that sin and all that grossness and envelops me with his love. And church, when I spend a few minutes thinking about how much God has forgiven me, how gracious he's been to me, it becomes a lot harder to let bitterness dominate my heart and life because of Jesus Christ and him crucified. One more and we'll be done. Some of you doubt God's love. Some of you struggle with God's provision or decisions. Some of you deal with addictions or depression or bitterness. But maybe some of you, the issue is right there in your marriage. Oh, I hear what you're saying, but my marriage, my marriage is where I find pain and difficulty. What can I find in that Jesus Christ and him crucified to help my marriage? Well, everything, friends. Paul said to the Ephesians, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and what? And gave himself for her there on the cross. What an example Jesus gives to us husbands. How are we to love our wives like Jesus does? How are we to love like Jesus? Well, that's okay. I'm the lo- no, no, that's not what he's talking about. <laughs> Jesus loved sacrificially. He died to himself there on the cross. And as husbands and wives, wives are to love their husbands too. We are to love one another just like Jesus loves us, sacrificially. Not always having to be first. Not always having to be honored. But to honor our spouse above ourselves. To model Jesus in our marriages. It will transform the most difficult of relationships. When I say I'm determined to treat you like Jesus treats me. Loving, being consistent, even when I'm all over the map. That's how I'm going to love and serve you because that's how Jesus loves and serves me. And we can have a brand new marriage if we remember the ultimate lesson is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Friends, as we go through our days and lives, there's always a temptation to be relevant, to be culturally savvy, to have the catchphrases down. And there's nothing wrong with that at all, not at all. But never forget there is power in Jesus Christ and him crucified. I remember years ago, I was speaking at a high school camp, and I was the only speaker all week. So 13 messages over seven days. And I was real excited to do that because they gave me no boundaries. I could teach whatever I wanted. And so I just brought the best of the best. The best 13 messages from the previous two years. That's what I brought up. Just the most funny, the most witty, the most emotional. Like just, just the best stories that were told. Just the best of the best and wove them into some kind of theme that I came up with. And it was a lot of fun, I'll be honest. Like there was no boring studies. It was all really good. And kids were interactive and they enjoyed it and liked it. But the fruit wasn't what I was hoping for. Watching kids just surrender and worship being powerful, it just, it just wasn't what I was looking for. And so the last night, we, we decided to do communion. And I put away the 13 most funny, relevant, powerful messages I had taught over the last two years. And I just want to talk about Jesus tonight. And we just went through the crucifixion. Everything that happened to Jesus there on the cross, the brutality that he went through, the the steps and stages of which he was crucified. And at the end of that night, the movement of God in that room was unmatched and unparalleled. Hundreds of kids came up and gave their life or rededicated their life to the Lord. Kids are in ministry today and they point back to that night there at that camp when they decided they wanted to serve the Lord. And I look back and I go, of course, The power isn't in my brilliance. Praise the Lord, there isn't much there. The power isn't in pithy sayings. 
The power isn't in funny stories, though I know they can be enjoyable when sermons start to drag on. I'm going to stick with them. Don't worry. But the power is in the name of Jesus and him crucified. And I share that with you because that is available to all of us. Not all of us are gifted communicators. Not all of us are gifted musicians. Not all of us have the ability to take words and form pictures in people's hearts. But all of us have been impacted by the power of Jesus and the cross of Jesus Christ. And we can take that message to our own hearts and realize it's Jesus and Him crucified. We can take that message to our groups of friends, our sphere of influence, and say, it's Jesus and Him crucified. And when I'm faced with a mountain in front of me at this moment, I can say, I know the answer was illustrated. I know the answer was demonstrated. I know the principle was there on the cross of Jesus Christ. So God, help me to see it and be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you so much for your word to us. And I thank you that, I believe at least, Paul just had this epiphany as he comes to Corinth. I'm just going to talk about you, Jesus. I'm just going to talk about your resurrection and your death and resurrection. I'm, I'm just going to focus on the basics and how you transformed a city with what appears on the surface to be such a simple message, but we know it's far more than that. And it is everything we need for life and godliness. And so I pray today, Lord, as we end by doing what is so appropriate in this moment, to end today by taking communion together. Lord, I pray that we would be reminded of the power of your name and the power of what you did on the cross for us how relevant it is more than anything else to face what we're facing in our lives today. God, remind us of that truth. In your name we pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've never committed your heart to Jesus Christ. Personally, I think, and the Bible seems to back me up, that it's important that before we just go through religious partaking of communion, that it's not an empty symbol, that you, you are in right standing with the Lord. And obviously, more, far more than just taking communion, the importance of you being saved is, is endless in its importance. We're all sinners apart from Jesus Christ, and we need a Savior, and we have one in Jesus who lived a sinless life and then died in my place and yours on the cross. And when he rose from the grave three days later, he declared everything he ever said was true, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father but through him. And today you can begin your relationship with the Lord. If you're watching online, there's a little place in the chat bar where you can click a button that says, I want to give my life to the Lord. If you're sitting in the sanctuary today, if you're in the video sanctuary, I just encourage you, if you're, you're serious about walking with the Lord, then just in the quietness of your own heart, would you repeat this prayer after me? Lord, I believe in you. I believe that you're my Savior. And I, I'm realizing, Lord, I need you desperately. So I want you to come into my life. I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my Lord. Today, I give my life to you. And I pray that in Jesus' name.